Good morning. Good morning. Is everybody awake? <laughs> <laughs> it's so good to have you all here this morning. Those who are going to be with us in person and those who are joining us on Facebook, I am certainly glad to be with you as we gather to worship our God. Once again, we thank you all for being here at our meeting today. Um, special prayers today to uh, for Haley Yurtovic. Uh, Haley is going to be baptized, receive First Communion, and be confirmed at our living service today. She's a, a niece of Helen Grant. So please keep her in her prayer, prayers as she makes this next step in her faith journey. Our annual meeting of the congregation is today after the late service. Lunch will be started at 12.15 and the meeting will start around 12.45, so if you are planning on Zooming in, uh, if, you, if we have your email, you got oh, you received the link on an e email uh, for the Zoom uh, option of the, the meeting, so you certainly can Zoom in if you want, um, and that part will start around 12.45, okay? The... Uh, Wednesday night Bible study will continue at 6 p.m. And uh, if you are interested in being part of that, let me know. I'll send you the Zoom link uh, if you want to Zoom in or show up in person. Uh, we meet in Fellowship Hall. And the reason we meet there is because we can safely socially distance and still be able to hear each other. <laughs> okay. So uh, I invite you to be part of that. And now let us prepare our hearts for worship.
we are gathered in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us confess our sins in the presence of God and of one another. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you and your beloved children. We have turned our faces away from your glory when it did not appear as we expected. We have rejected your word when it made us confront ourselves and have failed to show hospitality to those who call us to welcome. Accept our repentance for the things we have done and the things we have left undone. For the sake of Jesus Christ, have mercy on us. Forgive and lead us that we may bathe in the glory of your Son, born among us, and reflect your love of all creation. Amen. Rejoice in this good news. Our sins are forgiven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, live as free and forgiven children of God. Amen. Glory to God. Glory. 
glory to God in the highest. Glory to God and peace to God's people on earth. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, my God, Lamb of God, you take. Seated at the right hand of the Father, receive a prayer. Glory to God, glory to God, glory to God in the highest. Glory to God, glory to God, and peace to God's people. Gospel of John, that's the fourth chapter, first verse. Now when Jesus learned that the Pharisees had heard, Jesus is making and baptizing more disciples than John, although it was not Jesus himself, but his disciples who baptized. He left Judea and started back to Galilee, but he had to go through Samaria. So he came to a Samarian city called Sychar. Near the plot of ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. Joseph's well was there, and Jesus, tired out by his journey, was sitting by the well. It was about noon. A Samaritan woman came to draw water, and Jesus said to her, Give me a drink. His disciples had gone to the city to buy food. The Samaritan woman said to him, How is it that you, a Jew, Asked a drink of me, a woman of Samaria. Jews do not share things in common with Samaritans. Jesus answered her, If you knew the gift of God, and who it is that is saying to you, Give me a drink, you would have asked him, and he would have given you living water. The woman said to him, Sir, you have no bucket, and the well is deep. Where do you get that living water? Are you greater than our ancestor Jacob, who gave us the well, and with his sons and his flocks drank from it? Jesus said to her, Everyone who drinks of this water will be thirsty again, but those who drink of the water that I will give them will never be thirsty. The water that I will give will become in them a spring of water, gushing up to eternal life. The woman said to him, Sir, Give me this water, so that 
that I may never be thirsty or have to keep coming here to draw water. Jesus said to her, Go, call your husband and come back. The woman answered him, I have no husband. Jesus said to her, You are right in saying, I have no husband. For you have had five husbands, and the one you now have is not your husband. What you have said is true. The woman said to him, Sir, I see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshipped on this mountain. But you say that the place where people must worship is in Jerusalem. Jesus said to her, Woman, believe me, the hour is coming when you will worship the Father, neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You worship what you do not know. We worship what we know, for salvation is from the Jews. But the hour is coming, is now here, when the true worshippers will worship the Father in spirit and truth. <coughs> for the Father seeks such as these to worship him, God is spirit. But those who worship him must worship in spirit and truth. The woman said to him, I know that Messiah is coming. Who is called Christ? When he comes, when he comes, he will proclaim all things to us. Jesus said to her, I am he, the one who is speaking to you. Just then his disciples came. They were astonished that he was speaking with the woman, but no one said, What do you want? Or why are you speaking with her? Then the woman left the water jar and went back to the city. He said to the people, Come and see a man who told me everything I have ever done. He cannot see the Messiah, and he, they left the city and were on their way to him. Meanwhile, the disciples were to him, Rabbi, eat something. But he said to them, I have food to eat that you do not know about. So the disciples said to one another, Surely, no one has brought him something to eat. And Jesus said to them, My food is to do the will of him who sent me and to complete his work. Will you not say, Four months more, then comes the harvest? But I tell you, look around you and see how the fields are ripe with harvesting. The reaper is already receiving wages and is gathering fruit for eternal life. So that sower and reaper may rejoice together. For here the saying holds true one sows and another reaps. Except you to reap that which you do not labor. Others have labored, and you have entered into their labor. Many Samaritans from the city believed in him because of the woman's testimony. He told me everything I have ever done. So when the Samaritans came to him, they asked him to stay with them, and he stayed there two days. And many more believed because of his word. They said to the woman, it is no longer because of what you have said that we believe, for we have heard ourselves, and we know that this is truly the Savior of the world, the gospel of the Lord. Lord, place your words upon my lips and in my heart that I may proclaim your truth. Water it tastes so good. It tastes so good especially when our throat is parched and dry. Water one cannot live without it. Without water, our body would die. As we all know, water is part of our everyday living. Think about all the things we do every day or throughout the week with water. We wash our hands. We bathe. We brush our teeth. We wash our clothes and dishes. 
We use water for cooking. We make ice cubes. We have water in our swimming pools and our spas. We wash our cars. And many, many more. To us, water is the common and ordinary stuff of life. It is truly part of our everyday living. In the United States, we are spoiled by the amount of good water that we have available to us. It is amazing to realize that our human body is composed of 70% water. It's difficult to imagine that 70% of the flesh standing before you today is water. That means about 182 pounds of water are standing before you right now. I'm not going to tell you what I weigh, but I guarantee that 70% of my body weight and your body weight is composed of water. There are two and a half quarts of water within our blood. There are 15 quarts of water in the extra plasma in our body. There are 30 quarts of water in the cells of our body, allowing all those little cells to grow. It's amazing that 182 pounds of water are standing before you today at this very moment, isn't it? Truly, I am living water. Some people say that I'm a bag of wind. Others say that I'm a bag of hot air. But in actuality, I'm a bag of water. Standing before you today is walking, breathing, living water. Water is important to my diet, and it's important to your diet, I'm sure. We cannot live without water. Water is more important to our diet than food. Isn't that fascinating? Maybe you didn't know that fact. A human can exist for 30 days without food but can only exist one to four days without water. No one can live without water. Water is an important part of our everyday life. It is part of our essential life. It is with all of this in mind that we hear the words of Jesus from this passage, the water I give is living water. Whoever drinks of the living water I give will never thirst. Those who believe in me, out of their heart will flow rivers of living water. The rivers of living water I give will become a spring of living water, welling up into eternal life. The story we heard today is a great story offered by Jesus that is oftentimes misunderstood. The story of Jesus meeting the woman at the well. This occurs in part because we have a tendency to read this story in isolation of the rest of, God, of John's gospel. And in part, because of the church's history, 
of unjust treatment of women. There are assumptions that are made in relationship to this passage that we read into the passage that aren't there. The main assumption is that the Samaritan woman must be a prostitute. This presumption is often rationalized by the conversation that Jesus had with her about her husband. However, if we read more closely, we discover that there is nothing in the passage that makes this an obvious interpretation. Neither John as narrator nor Jesus as the central character supply that information. Jesus at no point invites repentance for this woman or for that matter speaks of sin at all. He very easily could have been widowed or have been abandoned or divorced Five times would be heartbreaking, but not impossible. Further, she could now be living with someone that she was dependent upon, or be in what's called a levirate or a levirate marriage, where a childless woman is married to her deceased husband's brother in order to produce an heir. Yet it's not always technically considered the brother's wife. There are many, there are any number of ways, in fact, that one might imagine this woman's story as tragic rather than scandalous. The difficulty with all the two regular interpretation is that it interrupts and distracts from the rest of the story. Immediately after Jesus describes her past, she says to him, I see that you are a prophet. And she asks Jesus where one should worship. If we believe the worst of her, this is nothing more than a clumsy attempt to change the topic. But if we can imagine another scenario, things look differently. Keep in mind that seeing in John is an important theological activity. To see is often connected with belief. When the woman says, I see you are a prophet, she is therefore not changing the subject, but making a confession of faith, which would be in line with the previous story that John shared with us. Why did she make this confession of faith? Because Jesus has seen her. He has seen her plight of dependence, not immortality or immorality, excuse me. He has recognized her, spoken with her, offered her something of incomparable worth. He has seen her. She exists for him. She has worth, value, significance. And all of this is treatment to which she is unaccustomed. And so when Jesus speaks of her past, both knowingly and compassionately, she realizes she is in the presence of a prophet. For this reason alone, she risks the central question that has the Samaritans and Jews 
for centuries. Where is the proper place to worship? This is a heartfelt question that gets to the core of what separates her from Jesus. And when Jesus surprises her with an answer that is simultaneously more hopeful and penetrating than she had expected, she leaves her water jar behind to run and tell her neighbors about this man that she met at the well. Can we imagine that John has not placed before us a morality tale, but rather is offering this woman as a striking and inspiring example of faith. Of what happens when Jesus likewise sees us and invites us to see and believe in him in return. The contrast with the passage from last week only confirms this interpretation. Nicodemus, after all, is a Jewish man and leader who comes to Jesus only after the sun has set. Night, we recall, functions symbolically in John as the time of disbelief and dark deed. This woman, by contrast, is a Samaritan woman of no account. She's not even given a name in the story. She comes to Jesus at noon, the middle of the day. Not, by the way, because she was ashamed of her shady past and so wanted to avoid her neighbors, as the traditional interpretation reads. But because just as darkness represents disbelief in John, so also daylight signifies faith. In the presence of the light of the world, this woman leaves behind her ordinary tasks of life in order to share the extraordinary news of the one who sees us truly and deeply, loves us as we are, and commissions us to share this news with others. Can we hear the echoes from the earlier passages in this gospel that we've read pre in previous weeks? For while the contrast with Nicodemus is clear, so also is her similarity to Andrew, who after responding to Jesus' invitation to come and see goes and tells his brother Peter that they have found the Messiah. The pattern is again repeated in Philip's invitation to Nathaniel to come and see. This nameless woman shares the same insight and activity as Jesus' principal disciple, except perhaps that where they each told one other person, she tells all of her neighbors. In this story, John is inviting us to imagine that anyone, even someone as unlikely as this nameless Samaritan woman, or even as likely as us, is seen by Jesus, loved by Jesus, and has the capacity to bear witness to the one who comes to enlighten our lives, to enlighten our world, and to give us living water to satisfy even our deepest thirst. Jesus is the living water of our faith that we cannot live without. And the people of God said, Amen. Amen.
in your promises. We lift thee and all of our prayers to you in confidence and faith. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. And also with you. Let us offer to one another a sign of Christ's peace. The Lord Jesus.
It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful God, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. By the leading of a star, he was shown forth to all nations. In the waters of the Jordan, you proclaimed him, your beloved son. And in the miracle of water turned to wine, he revealed your glory. And so with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth, and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my, in my blood. Which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Let us pray with confidence as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who are against us. And we give us our temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom. And the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Come to God's table. There is a place for you and enough for all.
The body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen us and keep us in his grace. Amen.